Good morning, everybody. It is good to see each and every one of you this morning. I want to give a giant thank you and shout out to a, a number of folks, uh, all of you folks that provided Easter eggs yesterday. Um, we, we, we don't hide them like we used to when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, if you were going Easter egg hunting, you, you generally needed a shovel or something to, to find where they had been stuffed in a hole or something like that. But the ground was littered yesterday with plastic eggs and lots and lots of happy kids and happy families. Um, for those of you that provided eggs, our Couples for Christ class uh, set up a table where they gave away cookies and invitations to be here on Easter and we had a whole slew of our folks that were there. So if, if anyone has any doubt that First Baptist is for Jones County, if they were there yesterday, they would know that we are for Jones County. We want them to know that Jesus is for Jones County, and it was, it was a pretty cool event yesterday. Just a reminder, two services on Easter. We're asking you to worship at one and serve in the other if you can. So please text Laura or stop by the welcome desk downstairs to tell her that you can help out in one of the services. Also, the last announcement is we want First Baptist to be the place where you find Jesus and you give Jesus away. And one of the ways we want you to find Jesus is in the fellowship of the people here. If you're visiting with us, we're grateful that you chose First Baptist to, to visit this morning. And I pray that you will find fellowship with our members today. And I pray that all the members will find fellowship with each other. It's one of the things that keeps us coming back is the fact that Jesus moves in our hearts and makes us one. So let's remember that, and as we go our way this week, we want to give Jesus away. Everywhere we go, tell his story just a little bit. Do your good work so people can see them and know that he is our Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask you this morning that you would you would cause us to be still so that we would see you and the overflow of our adoration would erupt into praise for you that we realize what you have done for us and how our lives are different and how you've given us friends and family and all of this Lord for your good pleasure it makes you happy and that you love us so much. I pray that we would lift our voices to you, that our hearts would be pure for this hour, and that you would be all that's on our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Terry Moore, I know he probably has a fancy title with the Gideons. Uh, I don't know what the title is. All I know is that Terry has been a big encouragement to me ever since I've been here. And, uh, and he sports an awful lot of churches. And he's come this morning to talk for a few minutes about the work of the Gideons. And I pray as you listen to him, not only you hear the stories, but maybe one or two of you, your heart would be stirred to be involved with this organization. Uh, they do an awful lot of good work. When we have city lights and hallowed nights, they're passing out scriptures in the middle of all of that. So it's good stuff. Brother Terry, if you'd come. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good uh, morning. Is there anybody here who doesn't own a Bible? Okay, well that's my job, you know, seek out people that don't own a Bible and be sure they get one. I don't find too many takers in Baptist churches, but you never know. How many of you have two Bibles? Or more? How many of the chance now? How many of you have five Bibles or more? How about that? I know Joyce does, my wife. She's got maybe 50. If there's a translation, she's got it. The Gideons have three missions to accomplish one objective. We meet to read scripture, pray together, and plan our ministry every weekly. We uh, distribute God's word. You've seen our Bibles in hotels, in the military, hospitals, wherever you go. Uh, but, and then lastly, one-on-one -on -one witnessing, using our personal witness testaments. Uh, but all three of these missions are to fulfill only one objective, just one. 
and that's to win men, women, boys, and girls to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. And we're laymen. We are not ministers. Sometimes a Gideon gets called into the ministry and we have to give them a going away party because they've been promoted. Gray First Baptist Church has partnered with the Gideons every year since our local camp was formed in 2007. Last year, your gift to the Gideons helped us distribute 87 million copies of God's Word in 200 nations and over 100 languages around the world. 26 years ago, when I first became a Gideon, our Bibles cost a dollar and 45 cents apiece. However, we got the price down to $1.20 now. You see, when you order 87 million, they'll give you a volume discount. And the, the deal, I, I'm really thankful that we can offer you this kind of investment opportunity into the kingdom of God. Because see, $12 means 12 people are going to receive a Bible who might otherwise never receive one. $120, 100 people, because that price includes the purchase and the distribution. That puts the Bible in somebody's hand. And your gift is 100% used for that purpose. We don't take anything out for overheads. Gideons pay their own expenses as we do what we do. I want to tell you about the power of God's word. Without a missionary, without a Gideon, without a pastor, this story comes to us from Colombia in South America where we had an international scripture blitz and gave out 1,100,000 copies of God's word. Well, you know, Colombia is famous for producing cocaine, the world's largest cocaine producing nation. And in the jungles, they have these things they call cocaine labs. They don't look like labs. They look like jungle camps, okay? But that, there's where they pick the leaves and they soak them in gasoline and they prepare coca base and they prepare cocaine to send to the addicts of the world who are enslaved to it. A very wicked enterprise. And then these cocaine labs are constantly under the threat of the government, the Col Colombian military seeking them out, and even in some cases the CIA of the United States trying to erase them. So these drug lords hire people to come in and work these labs, like 40 to 50 people. And their job is to produce the cocaine, but they're also given automatic weapons in case of a battle with the military. Well, you got to provide for these guys because they're going to be in the jungle for a long time. So you lay in a bunch of groceries and you get some reading material and DVDs and whatever else you need to keep people, you know, medicine, whatever. Well, this one particular lab neglected to bring any reading material for the men. And while that stuff's cooking off, there's a lot of leisure time, discretionary time. But because the Gideons had been down there and given out those one million copies, one of the men brought with him a little testament. And during their leisure time, he was reading it. Well, the other men saw him reading it and asked if they could read it too. And, and so soon there was a contest for who would get to read the little book. Well, it got so bad that the management had to develop this chart that showed when each of the men would have their turn reading the testament. Well, soon they had to close down the lab. Forty men were saved, and twelve became pastors. Now, there was no missionary there. There was no Gideon there. There was no pastor there. There was only the word of God. So that's what we're here for. That's what we do. Around the world, there are two and a half billion people who have never seen a copy of God's word, even from a distance, never heard the name of Jesus. I'm glad you've got a copy of God's word. 
I have many copies, but somehow I grieve that each of us here can have many copies of God's Word, while so many around the world will never see a Bible unless we take it to them. Thanks. Thank you for allowing me to be here. God intended for all people to have a copy of his word. That's what it's for. Thank you very much. At the end of the service, those of you who are moved uh, will have ushers at the door here and in the chapel that uh, will accept any donations to the Gideons. You want to write a check, I believe you write it out to the Gideons International, and uh, there'll be folks to collect that at the door. And if you are, if, if as you listen to the story, if your heart's stirred by that and you go, you know, that's something I'd be interested in, Brother Terry would love to talk to you. He'll be out in the, out in the uh, chapel, and anybody that wants to can drop by and speak to him. If you would, turn your Bibles to John chapter, 11, uh, chapter 10 and go to the 22nd verse. I prayed an unusual prayer this morning. I prayed, Lord, don't let my sadness over this scripture translate into boredom for the people of God. Because this is a transition point. And it, to me, it is a very, very sad thing. Uh, while you're turning, I want to mention too, you see the ferns that are all around. Uh, Cecil Etheridge makes sure that we have all the stuff in here and makes the place look pretty. This is Palm Sunday. When Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, which was a horribly sad day because people are so fickle that on this day they cried, Hosanna, Jesus, save us. And in a week they'll be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And all of this sort of works together. John chapter 10, beginning with the 22nd verse. Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem and it was winter. Jesus was walking in uh, in the temple, in Solomon's colonnade, the Jews surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, I did tell you, and you didn't believe, Jesus answered them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? We're not stoning you for the good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered, isn't it written in your law? This comes from the Psalms. I said you are God? No. Yes. If he called those whom the word of God came to gods and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I'm the son of God? If I am not doing my Father's work, don't believe me. But if I'm doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am the Father and then they were trying to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. So he departed once again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptized earlier, had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. You know, there's going to come a day when the Gideons will no longer be able to do their work. When I was a kid... Uh, many of you who are in my generation, when we were kids, and you know school ended in the sixth grade, they didn't go beyond, that's not true. Actually, when I was in elementary school is when Cobb County actually did have a 12th grade. They moved from 11 to 12, as times have changed. Anyway, uh, back in those days, the Gideons had rain on, on, on property, and they would come into the classroom, and they'd give us the little testaments. And nowadays, I don't think they have quite that ability to do anymore. And I expect as time passes, we will have to try harder and harder and harder to get the word out. 
because the world is changing and it's not embracing Jesus. It's saying that we are God and we don't need him. Now, when you have the scripture in front of you, what I've, I've said to you over and over again, I want us to make sure that we read it. When we go to the Bible, we tend to shift gears in our mind and read the Bible differently than we read anything else. And I don't know about you, I've caught myself before getting to a familiar passage and it's almost like my brain goes into fast forward and I just sort of zip through that passage and get to the next one and move on. And, and, and we're reading it differently than we would read anything written by Clive Cussler. Clive Cussler is my favorite fiction writer in the world. He's going to be an elderly man, but he's a smart guy. He's training other people to write in his style with his characters. So I ought to have his books until the day I'm called home. And I can sit down with Cussler's books and start reading and absolutely be transported. I'll forget where I am. I'll forget what's going on. I'm just in this story until I either have to quit or I finish the book. And I'm always sad at the end of the book. And I'm reading that book and I'm looking for similes and metaphors and allegory and foreshadowing. I'm looking for all of those things because that's what you do when you read literature. You need to do the same thing when you read the Bible. Even though it's inspired by God over thousands of years, written by a number of different people, they used the same thing that we all hated in English. When we learned all of that, those literature, de literary devices, and we hated it, and we took the test, and it made us mad, and we said, we'll never, we'll never use these things in a million years. Yes, you do, every time you read, and it's right here, and that's why this is so sad. This scripture is horribly sad. Verses 23 and 24 say, um, uh, 22 and 23, then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. Okay, it's the festival of dedication. Now, there's two things. So y'all follow me. I'm going to give you a little quick history lesson. Give you a little bit of quick history lesson for what the festival of dedication was. Back in, those, back in 176 B.C., there was a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. I like to say his name because it trips off your tongue. Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a, a Roman guy that came in and led the army into Jerusalem and took it over. They were invading that whole area. And one of the things that they wanted to make sure they did is they wiped out all religions except the Roman religion, and they, they, they worshiped Zeus. And so he went into the temple. Now think of how you would feel if this happened to us here. They went into the temple. They went into the church. And where the altar was for our God, he put over all of that Zeus stuff and turned it into an altar for Zeus, and in the middle of that, of the temple, he, he offered a sacrifice to Zeus. Can you imagine if somebody came in this church and changed this whole stage over to an altar to Satan and came in here and did a satanic worship service? How we would all feel wouldn't, wouldn't go over very well. Didn't go over very well for them either. So a guy by the name of Judas Maccabeus, they got paid by how many letters were in their name. The man by the name of Judas Maccabeus got a group of, Jew, of Jewish men together and they revolted against Rome. Now these guys were outnumbered, they were outarmed, they were outstrategized, but they won. And they drove all of Romans out of there. And in 174 B.C., two years later, they, they dedicated the temple again and had the first sacrifice that had happened in two years to the Almighty God in the temple at Jerusalem. And that made it the Feast of Dedication. But in this context, in John, this dedication feast, see, that was a time for the true sacrifice to happen. Not the one to Zeus, but a real sacrifice. The pure sacrifice. God's sacrifice. And there's foreshadowing all over this thing. Because here this happened then to purify the temple, but now the Lamb of God is going to be sacrificed. The last one. The last sacrifice that will have have, ever have to take place. But to make this thing dark, 
is John says, not only was it this time of year, oh, I got to tell you this or it won't be, you'll miss something. Festival of the, the, the uh, Randy went blank. The festival of dedication happened every year in December. Okay? Keep that in your head. Happened every year in December. In fact, it happened generally on or about December the 25th. Does that day ring a bell to anybody? That is Christmas Day. And this happened right around that time period. Now, he says it's the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem and it was winter. If somebody tells you something obvious, there's a reason for them to do that. And he says, festival of dedication, which always happens in the, uh, always happens in the wintertime. It's always going to happen in December. It's always going to be happening around what we consider our Christmas time. And he turns right around and says, you know, this happens in the winter, and it was winter. And you go, what? Again, there's foreshadowing that's going on in here. It's wintertime in Jerusalem. It gets to be about 40 degrees, you know, sort of like March in Georgia. It gets to be 40 degrees. It's sort of cool. It rains a lot. That's why Jesus is walking in Solomon's colonnade. It's the only place in the temple that everybody could gather, Jew and Gentile alike, and be out of the elements. It was probably a day that looked just about today. And John says, it was winter, and we know that. And what he's telling us is, what happens in winter? In winter, the harvest is over. And everything, there is no more, listen, oh, here's the point. There is no more harvest to be had. It's done. And chapter 10 of the book of John ends the public ministry of Jesus. From this point on, it's going to move into Jesus and the disciples and Jesus and a few people. This is the last time he's going to speak to a whole group of just people. The harvest is past. The opportunity for many of these people to be saved is gone. And it rings Jeremiah 8, sort of rings in your head, where it says, harvest is past, summer has ended, but we have not been saved. I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people. I mourn. Horror has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? He's not talking about his wife and children. He's not talking about his immediate family or even his immediate group of friends. What he is talking about here is his dear people. Folks, that's the attitude that we've got to develop as we do for Jones County. This isn't just a slogan. These people are our people. These are our people. Where we go and we go and we see them around, every one of these influences our life in some way. No, they don't. They vote. They go to your schools. They go in the same places that we shop and eat and all the things. We have interaction. These are are our people and he looks at them and he says I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people I mourn horror he says what a word horror has taken hold of me because I know they're broken I know they are lost do you remember the definition I think this is profound and I hope you wrote it down because this is about the best thing I think I've ever said Lost means you are not where you're supposed to be. That's what it means. You are not where you're supposed to be. And he looks at his people and he looks out across Jones County and he sees that these people are not where they're supposed to be. Folks, think about this. Think about this for a minute. I had an opportunity to be near parents and children and some of the things that came out of the parents mouths toward those children no how many children grow up in Jones County and never listen my kids got disciplined 
They'll tell you right this minute. They got disciplined. I had no problems applying the hand to the hiney. That is not a problem in my house. But sometimes the hand to the hiney didn't work. You had to do things like take games away from them. I think I remember correctly, and my wife can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we took a door off of somebody's room one time because that needed to occur. I have no problems doing those kind of things. But the one thing that my children knew, and I got a feeling one thing that your children know, is that no matter how much trouble they're in, they're in trouble because we love them, and we know that God created them special, that they were fearfully and wondrously made, and that God has a plan for their life, and they'll be somebody sometime. And there are kids in Jones County whose parents do not treat them that way because they don't see them as fearful fearfully and wondrously made they don't know God and they can't and so they tell these kids that you will never amount to a hill of spit and the child believes them because they don't have they are broken and that's what Jeremiah saw and that's what John is foreshadowing now, you move, to, you move to verse 24. You move to verse 24, and we think these religious leaders, they're the most obtuse people on the planet, but they're not. They know exactly what they're doing. The Jews surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. That phrase, how long are you going to keep us in suspense, is a polite way of translating what was said there. The actual words themselves are how long are you going to take away our spirit? And that was, that was sort of a, a, an expression they would use that said this, how long are you going to annoy me? How long are you going to get on my last nerve? How long are you going to provoke me? That's what they're asking Jesus. How long are you going to continue to do this stuff? What we want you to do, Jesus, is just tell us up and down, are you the Messiah or are you not? Because here's the deal. If you say you're not the Messiah, then we ain't going to worry about you no more. All the people will quit following you. They'll die down over time and you'll just go away. But if you say you are the Messiah, we know plainly that you're not because, see, you cut grass on Sunday, and we all know what happens to people that cut grass on Sunday. You do that, and so we know where you're going. And if you'll just go ahead and say that I am the Messiah, we can kick it into high gear, and we can get rid of you, and we don't have to worry about being provoked by you anymore. Just say the words. And Jesus once again looks at him and says, listen, I told you, and you don't believe me? The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. Listen to this. I don't have to say words. Pay attention to what I do, and you'll see who I am. And we know because of the Old Testament that what the Old Testament said Messiah would do, Jesus did, so we know who he is. Is. But now there's a principle right here for us as we prove that we're for Jones County because Jesus is for Jones County. We don't, do, we don't just do good things to be good people. We're doing good things for a purpose. We want people to see us. We want people to see what we do, not as show-offs, but so that people can see Jesus in us. It's what we want. That's the point. We're not just being good to be good. Anybody can be good. Bill Gates does a whole lot more good than this church will ever do as far as philanthropy is concerned. The man's got resources like nobody's business. What's the old joke? That if he bends down and picks up a $100 bill laying on the ground, he loses money because he wasted that time? If there were a $100 bill laying on the ground here, we'd all dive in and fight over it. It's not good just to be good. There's a purpose behind this. We do good things because we're his sheep. That's what his sheep do. And because of that, people see that. Now, follow Jesus' argument here. Into verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. You don't have to believe what I'm saying, but watch what I do. And you'll see something that you recognize in the works that I do. You'll see the works of the Father, and you'll know 
that the Father is in me. That's what he's saying. We're saying the same thing to folks. You don't have to believe what I'm saying about Jesus. You don't have to believe what I'm saying about the Bible. You don't have to believe what I'm saying about God. You don't have to believe any of that. But you watch what I do. And when you see what I do, you're going to know that there is something different here. And you might just find out that there is a Jesus and that he wants you too. But these leaders, they won't hear that. They won't hear anything he has to say. They don't want to hear. They want him gone. And before long, we're going to see their works, and we're going to know who their father is as well. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. He gives his sheep three gifts. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. I want you to remind you folks one more time, when you are saved, you enter into eternity. We went through Ephesians. It's in there. You know it. You're, you're baptized into Christ, and when he was resurrected, you were resurrected with him. That when God looks at our past, when he looks at our past, he sees the righteousness of Jesus and all of the junk that you've ever done and all of the bad things you've said and the people you've hurt and everything that goes before you, when God looks at you, he sees those things as gone. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. And everything that you did in the past, everything that you did in the past, everything that you did in the past has been redeemed so that you have the ability now to sit down with people and give them comfort like you were comforted by Jesus. You have the ability now to sit down with someone who has walked on your path and say to them, I've been where you are. I've hurt like you hurt. Let me tell you how God got me out of that and how he made me brand new. That's the deal. That's the deal. Jesus says he gives them eternal life. They'll never perish. Listen to me, what I said just a few minutes ago. Some of you have had bad things happen. They happened to you by accident. They happened because you chose to do them, whatever reason they happened. And somebody who loved you more than air said to you, they said to you, you have ruined your life. And Jesus is saying right here, the word perish means destroyed, perish, lost. Jesus is saying right here that your life cannot be destroyed. Your life, you can never perish. You can never be lost. Jesus saying, is saying that your life cannot be ruined because it belongs to him and no one can snatch you out of his hands ever. Period. Once you're his sheep, no one, nothing, anyone can do, can remove you from his hands, regardless of how you feel. Because your feelings ain't nothing but too much pepperoni pizza before you went to bed. It don't count. One last thing to notice. Verses 37 and 38 says, if I am doing my father's works, don't believe me. But if I'm doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. What Jesus is doing right here as this chapter comes to a close and this section of the book of John comes to an end. What Jesus is doing with these guys is he's saying, guys, one last time. One last time. You don't have to believe me. Believe the works, but believe the works so that you can see that God's in me and that God will change your life and change your heart. And they still said no. The scripture says they tried to grab him, but he eluded their grasp. I have no idea what that looks like. But they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't have it. Jesus left. He goes all it says then is he goes to where John the Baptist was baptizing. People came to him and listened, saw what he was doing, believed and were saved. But for these religious leaders, I want you to think about something. 
when I die and go to heaven, I have said that I'd like to meet Methuselah, oldest man ever lived. I want to meet Moses. I want to meet Elijah. I want to meet Samson. I want to meet Deborah. I want to meet uh, Peter and Paul and John and Mary. I should have said Peter, Paul, and Mary. That'd been cute, wouldn't it? Peter, Paul, John, Mary. All of these folks, I want to meet them all. I can't meet these religious leaders. They're not going to be there. They had their chance. And time is up. And they don't get another chance. And listen, I mean, we, we, we don't say this much in the church anymore because it, it, you know, it's just not the kosher way of going and doing things. But there will come a day that your time is up. And you don't know when it's going to be. You have no clue. I've told you about my Facebook, you know, South Cobb High School alumni page. Tony Chandler died. Tony Chandler, y'all y'all going to just, you're, you're, this is going to wow you to nobody, no end. When I was in the sixth grade, I was the lead singer for a band. We had a drummer, we had a guitarist, a lead guitar, a bass guitar, and yours truly singing. I'm not your stepping stone. Man, I tell you, we rock and rolled. Tony played lead guitar. He'll never play another note. Tony passed away. I'm going, golly. What happened? Well, he just caught something and died. And you know, hopefully we'll all live to be as long as our parents and maybe a little bit longer because of medicine nowadays, but you're not guaranteed any of that. And if you drive up and down 129 like I do every day, what's to say that today is not the day that that idiot, and I use that word on purpose, that has the hot pickup truck that's coming from Eatonton that always passes on a hill every time you see him because he's got a bad truck and he can just fly by everybody. What if today is the day that he misjudges the time just a little bit and he crests the hill right as I crest the hill? That happens, you know. We're not guaranteed anything. What happens if this is the last time you hear the gospel? That's why this is so sad to me. Jesus' ministry to all of these people that have heard him and, and they just listened and thought it was interesting, they don't get another chance. It's gone. It's over. It's complete. And when the day comes, when the day comes that they leave this life, we're not all going to heaven when we die. I don't care what Oprah says to you. She is doomed unless she changes. And I could belabor the point, go on and on, but there's the point, and that's why this is sad to me. Is that John, at this point in the book, is telling us, this is over. Now all that's left is for him to be crucified and die and resur be resurrected. But these people are lost for all time and eternity. There ain't nothing anybody can do about it. Let's pray together. Father, you are a patient, merciful God. When your people refused to trust you to enter the promised land, you didn't destroy them, even in the wilderness. You clothed them, you fed them, you gave them fresh water to drink. And when the rebellious people had all passed away, you led the remnant to take hold of the prize that you had waiting for them all along. Lord, we ask you to please remain patient with us as we struggle to follow you. So much in your word seems new to us and we chafe and, and sometimes we grumble over it. But Lord, we do want to follow you. We really do and we want everyone who will listen to learn your voice and follow you so that none of them will be lost anymore help us Lord to be obedient followers of Jesus 
Help us to see that your goal is for you to be glorified so that all who will hear, who might hear you, would come home where they belong. Help us, Lord, to see how good you have been to us so that we would be overjoyed and speak words of praise to you for you are so good. And we do so need a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, one day it'll be too late. The Bible teaches us that one day time as we know it will come to an end. There won't be any more time. The door is going to close. And when that door closes, no one else is going to enter. I ask you to let today be the day of your salvation. Don't put off the Spirit another day. Don't put him off, but surrender. The Bible says that you repent, which means that you look at the way things have been going in your life and you realize that that's not God's plan, and you look to him and you say, I'm not wanting to do that anymore. I want to follow you. And you believe Jesus that he died on the cross, that he resurrected, was resurrected from the tomb, and he did that to make a path for you to have eternal life, to give you a plan for your life, to give you hope, to give you peace. And you look at him, and all you say is, I need a Savior. And he takes it from there. I ask you to do that this morning. And if you are a Christian, you have done that already. I want you to think about what that means and how many people don't have what you have. And maybe pray for them for the next few minutes. And maybe God will do something. Would you stand?